for review this week? No, we didn't review. We ran out of time. That's all right. I'm not going anywhere. I doubt it. Special meeting of the Governing Board, San Bruno Park School District Order. Um, please stand and join us in the pledge of the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can we start with uh, roll call, please? Uh, Trustee Blanco? Here. Trustee Sanchez? Here. Trustee Chavez? Here. Trustee Mason? Here. Trustee Martinez? Here. Thank you. Um, adoption and change in the order of the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Hello. Okay, so I'm going to start with the uh, board study session. Our two discussion items. Um, first, the future, uh, item B1, for future use and disposition of the Angwell site. So I, I would like to welcome everybody this evening to, to our study session. Um, we have here uh, Tom Shannon, who is our property consultant, who will be uh, sharing some information uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the disposal or the, the use of the property. As you know, uh, we had a lease amendment to the property, and uh, with that lease amendment, a three-year clock has started. Uh, so this opportunity, uh, this evening, we'll have the opportunity to take a look at so one of our options uh, as a school district regarding this property. As you know, we have facility needs uh, uh, for the district, and uh, and those needs, the money, the cost of those are going up. And this uh, this evening, we'll have the opportunity to really think about uh, strategy, what we're going to do to take this asset and make it work for us as a school district. So I'd like to welcome Tom Shannon to come forward. Thanks. I have a uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Shannon, and uh, we're, what we're doing tonight is having a study session, so we welcome your input. I'm going to hand a package out to the board, and then we have some packages for the public, too, and then we're going to use slides. This will be posted with the agenda online following this meeting. Anybody else back here who would like to talk about it? Yep. Oh. Sure. <coughs> who would you like to talk about? Yep. All right. <coughs> so we have an agenda, and Stella gave you a brief introduction. The first slide I'd like you to take a look at is just to introduce an overview of the site plan. This is an engineered site map, and a lot of you are familiar with the site out there. This area in the bottom is the current driving range, and here's the arc of the green, uh, the tee boxes. And then this is the practice range, and this is your warehouse and your parking lot. This is the parking lot and parking down here. This is the uh, the sort of uh, temp uh, the portable, which actually runs the driving range. So anyway, this is approximately a 21 acre site. And uh, right now the topography, I'll probably not stand in front of this. This is kind of a spine of the site if you've been out there. And this is a bowl, and this is at a higher elevation. <coughs> so when we go through the disposition options, obviously you know, this piece could be just taken a look at, and this piece could be taken a look at. Or the site could be totally remaster planned, and then it would have to be completely regraded and engineered, and then we can have basically do whatever we want out there with the entire. I say 21 acres. The engineers estimate about five of these acres are topographically undevelopable. So 
So we have about 16 acres. Does anybody have any questions on this? I think most of you are familiar, but I, I, we at least think this map is pretty helpful as we go forward. Okay, then the next slide, Wendy. Yeah. So these are what I call global disposition options, and by no means are they the only disposition options, but I'm trying to give the board at least some information on values of four different disposition options. And um, the first one's a long-term ground lease for the entire site. So that would probably be at least somewhere in the order of 65 to 99 years. And I'm at least projecting right now in today's market, it would probably generate about 2.4 to $3 million a year in lease revenues. Okay, now in terms of just learning more about this site, the site is currently zoned R1 single family and it's general plan low density residential. And as most of you know, um, you can't, at least in our current market, real estate market, really lease single family land. So in other words, if we were gonna do a ground lease out here to some user, we'd probably have to work with the city and either go for a conditional use permit, which is how the driving range is operating, or go for a rezoning and general plan. Then the second option is simply a hybrid. It's saying, take those 10 acres that are, it really encompass the driving range and think about leasing those out and then hold 11 acres for future district flexibility. So to the district administration or you know, potentially down the road a workforce housing site. Uh, I, I wanna alert everybody, the 11 acres you'd be holding, six of those uh, 11 acres would be usable and the five are gonna be topographic challenge. So even though you'd be owning 11, you'd have probably about six that would be usable. And then the third is a hybrid lease where uh, one half of the site, 10 acres, is leased and the other half, or 10 acres, is sold. And uh, we'll assume that the 10 acres that are sold would include the five acres of hillside area. So on that one, I'm estimating that for 10 acres to lease, we'll probably get somewhere in the order of 1.3 million plus for, the, for lease revenues. And these leases would have escalations. This is just the beginning rents. And you know, it would be a, it's a fairly complex lease and I'm oversimplifying it right now, but this would sort of be your first year of revenues. And then if you sold 10 acres, there's potentially uh, available $25 million there. Uh, that's adjusted because there's five acres that can't be developed, but let's just say if it's single family zoning, you can work with the city to take the 10 acres, you know, have a density on those 10 acres and then build that density on the remaining six acres that are developing. So you can do a density transfer, so to speak, on the acres that you have to leave undeveloped. And then my last one is to consider selling the entire site and I at least have had feedback from the board that that's not really an option, but I at least wanted to give you the number the reason that number comes in at $70 million is when you have 21 acres, you have a tremendous amount of flexibility as to what can go on that site. So you can not only, you can maneuver houses into clusters and what have you, and uh, it gives a lot more flexibility, and that would basically involve a complete re-engineering of the site. Um, I'm open for discussion on, you know, some feedback on those, if you have any questions. Uh, Who's here? When you look at that map, and you see the uh, diagonal hash lines, is that the, what does that represent, the non-usable? You see it right there with your finger. Yes, this is, this is actually, <coughs> so what these engineers have really done is, this was more than likely the original piece of property before 280 was built, okay? And now on title, all this land is conditioned with easements, okay, which this happens a lot in school district property. There's never been a dedication, if you will, to Caltrans of this land, but you can't do anything with it. So this inner yellow line is actually your perimeter property that you own. 21 acres. 21 acres. Right. And what part of the acreage here is it the hillside that's not usable? Yeah, when we get over into this area, Right in here, this, I mean, 
you have to be careful with angles in topography, but right. this is extremely steep, right. so right in this area. So really, this whole side of the site is undevelopable right in here, and we probably have to remain in open space. So that, so the rest of that flat area, the two tiers that you mentioned? This piece and this piece and this that's piece. That's the 16th. That's the 16th. And I should have given everybody an orientation. So this is Ingvall Road coming down here, okay, and turning here. This is Sneath is up here. Sneath, Ingvall, turn in, come into John's warehouse. <laughs> um, basically, on this southeast corner, um, who owns this property here? Is this a buyer break? Um, the part that's outside of the yellow, I'm going to assume, is part of the city's property. Okay. Yeah. So I don't have title reports on stuff on the land outside of that yellow area. We could get it if you want. I just think it would be helpful, and, and I'll bring up some points he's, later after my Just for the audience, he's pointing to this piece right in here. It's the southeast, yeah. Um, I think what would be really valuable for the board is actually take a site walk that the map is super helpful. I, I actually pulled up, printed up, get Google Maps, yeah. uh, but this is far more useful. The idea is that the board can get an idea of where exactly where the property lines are and who owns what on either side of the property. Yeah, and I mean, for the most part, you can pretty much assume this is Caltrans, because these are their lanes coming down here. And this could be Caltrans right here, this is the, and then, this is going to probably be part of the open space of Crestmore Canyon. Does the Caltrans property, do they have to abide by the heritage tree policy of the city of San Bruno? Uh, I'm not going to speak for Caltrans. They're a state agency like you guys are. So typically, at least in my knowledge, like when you work with a school, building a school, you don't report to the city, you report to the state division of art. Just a quick question. Okay, that area outside the hash lines, that area there, you said that it's part of that uh, Crestmore Canyon? Who owns that? I think the city. Yep. The city owns that? Yep. Thank you. If you look at a Google map, you'll see how big Crestmore Canyon is. It's not shown here. Crestmore Canyon. Oh, it's, yeah, I'll get to that later. Yeah, it runs up, <laughs> runs up through the whole, whole spine. So, is that the beginning of Crestmore Canyon, where it goes to? It is. Yeah, I mean, if, if you will, the, uh, the, if you want to call it the easternmost point. Okay. Yeah. So when you look at the, uh, when you look at that, where the cutting range is, in that elevated area, how many acres is that total? Right here? Oh, the whole, the whole flat area with the parking lot and the... Yeah. This, I'm good, at least in, 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 Talk, I haven't talked specifically. This is approximately 10 acres so on the range. Six. So that would be six. Mm -hmm. And then you get into these extraneous pieces, which right. get you to your 21. <coughs> so, um, in terms of the single access there, um, currently, at the board, um, do any of the four options? lend themselves to what we have here you know, without making, um, without supposing that it's going to have to do a lot of other work. At least from what, you know, is there one that's essentially <coughs> useful? So it would seem to accommodate the <coughs> road. Um, so as we get down to the agenda, we can talk about it now. Oh, okay. So the access to the site is a variable. <coughs> um, if the site were to redevelop, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that the city would want a secondary access, and so we would have to come up with that. Yeah. Cities do not like one ingress and egress into any kind of development. Including the school? I mean, in the sense that the school was there, is that considered a low enough? Um, Again, because it was a school, you weren't under the jurisdiction of the city. 
you know, now the fire marshal does play somewhat of a role in the fire marshal would be on the site now if you had a student wanting to go to school here in terms of how he was going to get an engine through and around the site and get people evacuated. So, and I mean, I don't want to jump the gun. I mean, I've worked with Caltrans, not the easiest agency to work with, but there may be opportunities here to have what we call an EVA, emergency vehicle access, where a fire engine can break down a bollard or something and go through. So, and, and again, that's all in the city process. <coughs> so, I mean, just giving you guys, you might as well jump a little bit ahead in the agenda. So you have MOT down there in the corner. So that's another variable that we need to consider in terms of how we want to move forward on a disposition of the site, if any. Um, the other option I sort of explained is the city process, current zoning, single family. And so, you know, it's we've got the general plan as a low density. So this could be a residential site. But like I said, single family property right now, still you have to, people want to buy a house with fee title. They don't want to buy a house under a land lease. And then as Superintendent Kemp mentioned, we're under a three year timeline. That timeline started in December of 2019. So we've got three years from last December to elect to terminate. That's, that's your option. That's, there's, it's a, a unilateral option for the school board. Just to be clear, option number two hybrid is just you lease 10 acres and then you just hold another 11 acres for, for our use. To be termed, to used to be termed. And the, the little bit of uh, due diligence I've done, just it, most, at least people that feel that if this site became available are interested in the driving range side of the site. Okay. This is where the, the basically a lot, some of the interest has focused. And so this would, if, but it doesn't, that decision is yours. If you wanted to, you know, basically look to dispose of this portion of the property and then keep this portion, you could do that too. But I'm just sharing with you. And I think a lot of that's somewhat driven because they see that you have an MOT operation over there, there's a parking lot over there. So this is a lot easier to redevelop. Any other questions? I mean, we're, I, I've got two more schedules to just briefly go through with you. So, you know, something I thought might be helpful would just do what I call an advantages and disadvantages of leasing versus mm -hmm. selling. And so let's just talk about leasing first. The big advantage of a lease is that you retain ownership of the property, and that is a big, big advantage. You can also create a pre predictable stream of rents and for the education codes, rents can be transferred into the general fund. Um, the site could potentially be structured to offer you future flexibility for growth or, um, you know, and then upon lease expiration, you basically are given the property back unless you extend that lease. I will share with you in a lot of leases of this length, you know, 65 to 99 years, usually in around year 40, whoever's using the site reapproaches the school board and asks for an extension because they've got so much capital invested in the site already. So, and that's a fairly lucrative opportunity for a school board down the road because then the whole lease can be adjusted. Um, if, it didn't, if you didn't adjust, then at the end of that lease term, you would probably, I mean, at least current trends, you'd get highly appreciated property back. Um, and then one thing about lease revenues, if you feel fairly confident with your tenant, then you can use those to collateralize what we call a certificate of participation issue. I want to be very candid with you. COPs are collateralized by your general fund. So as long as your tenant's stable and the rents are coming in, that can amortize those certificates of participation. If the tenant were to default, they would have a right to tap the general fund to collect payments due on the certificate. So a lot of districts have used them very successfully. Just giving you one example, we built workforce housing at the community college district using certificates of participation. And then the rents, when the, when the workforce, the uh, 
certificate and non-certificate employees moved into that workforce housing, those rents paid off those COPs. COPs is certificate of participation. And that was that worked out very, very nicely for the college district because those developments were fully occupied from day one and the rent stream easily amortized the cost. They used COPs for the construction costs. Um, some disadvantages. You still own the property, so when you own property, you've got oversight and some management responsibilities. You would triple net or quadruple net these leases, but you'd still own the property, so you'd, you'd still have to pay attention to it. Um, again, possible uncertainties in the rent revenues, and that's driven by the tenant. Uh, the rent can be, one thing to think about sometimes is, let's say, and I'll just use this as an example, if you sold this for $70 million, okay, Interest rates are at all time low right now. The 30 year bond's trading at 3%. While 70 million, if you were able to keep that in the bank, could generate $2.1 million by simply investing it in US Treasury long term bond. I'm going to say over the time of this period, you know, interest rates will easily move probably to 4 or even 5%. 4% of 70 million becomes 2.8 million. <clears throat> the hardest part about this, and I've work with other districts is were you to sell this site and get the 70 million, it's very tough for boards to leave that 70 million sitting in an endowment. I've never seen it happen, so that's just something. That, it's a nice annual cash flow, but when a crisis arises, boom, that fund gets tapped. To the chair, but at the same time, this money can only be used for capital needs. It can, but the interest can be transferred. Right. That's right, fund. that's correct. And, and just to push on that a little bit, in, in severe crisis, if you ever want some midnight reading and you read specific sections of the code, some school districts actually got regulations in the code that they could transfer capital dollars to their general fund. I never recommend that. That is an incredibly dangerous precedent because those dollars dry up and now you suddenly have a general fund obligation that you can't figure out how to manage. Um, <coughs> What else happens? You know, if you own property, I do say that the site could be vulnerable to future zoning or changes or environmental laws. Normally, if it's developed and you own it under a long-term ground lease, they're not going to change the zoning because that user is going to be entitled to that zoning. But as you've seen over the course of the last 30 years, environmental laws have gotten very tough on property owners. Um, Oh, and then one last thing I'd like to highlight, a lot of times a private sector user will want you to subordinate this fee to a construction loan. And I'm just making a note here, don't do that. And your legal counsel won't let you do that either. But that means that the bank would have collateral in your site, and you don't have to do that. But you'll be asked, probably. Um, that's on le Any questions on leasing? And you know, there, this is not an end-all list. People come up with other ideas, so bear with me. There could be some other good advantages and disadvantages. So if we go to selling, you know, the only time really selling is really paramount is if a district's desperately in need of capital improvement funds. And you folks are gonna have to do some soul searching on that, because I know a little bit about your long-term plan, and I know how some of it's financed, and so how you're gonna ultimately pull off the whole modernization plan is something you're gonna have to do a little soul searching on. This site is extremely valuable. I'd say it's one of the most valuable sites in the district. So, right, and that's really because of its location at 280 and Um, If you do sell a site, there's no more management or oversight or maintenance. Uh, <laughs> My third bullet says you get a guaranteed stream of interest income, and again, that's if you're willing to pocket away that entire whatever balance and you keep it invested. Um, and again, the annual interest income, which is interesting, this is a you know a trade-off, can exceed the rent re revenue. So, like I said, if you did get 70 million at three percent, that's 2.1. I'm estimating 2.4 for the whole site, so that's sort of in the push range, but if interest rates were to climb, this could exceed what rent revenues are generating. Then again, interesting. <coughs> that's interesting, but you don't own the land. Right, that's the so point. when you, if you overlay it with the appreciation we've witnessed in the last 30 years, mm -hmm. you've been probably better off to hold the land. 
Uh, let's see. And then if you if you were to sell it, you know the zoning changes, environmental laws are non-existent for you. Disadvantages: biggest one, site's gone forever. Very hard to get back. Um, and it reduces your future flexibility if you ever needed to accommodate future district program needs. Sometimes if the site is sold, not sometimes, and you do have a large uh, inflow of proceeds, it can create political pressure, like I just mentioned, on the board in terms of how that money gets spent. And as uh, uh, Member Sanchez just said, you can only spend the principal on capital improvements and the interest can be transferred to the general fund. So that's, and then this bottom footnote, I just want to, I said this, but I want to re-emphasize, we're general plan, low density, residential, res residential. We're zoned R1, which is two to eight units an acre. That's what can happen to this site now. If something else has to occur, we've got to talk to the city. Now, and I should say a big overall caveat is if you have a school district who wants to do anything with it, then you've got a lot of options if you want to build that school district facility. So that sort of wraps up what I have for you tonight. Again, preliminary study session. Uh, wanted to get those maps to you so everybody. Um, so as Mr. Mason suggested, a, a walk on the site would be great if you want to do that together. I think we can certainly organize that. That'd be great. Yeah. Bring it back bring a, a walk with the reconvene, you know, kind of a debrief. Uh, more so, like we can, this agenda is going to be helpful to yeah. the measures. So. Yeah. I also think that um, in addition to the walk, um, option two, the hybrid options, seems very tasty. I like that. Um, I think I have a little bit more questions around know, district administration or location and workforce housing. I think this could require a larger community conversation. We bring in the city, we bring in planning, we bring in county interests. Um, this is a this is too small a meeting to, to dive this deep into this. It's the only question I'd have at least at your stage right. for workforce housing is you've got a very aggressive modernization program. Sure. Right. And so you as a district, if it's your workforce housing, have to come up with construction money to build the workforce housing. Uh, you can actually go out to some of the developers out there, but we've, I've worked with the high school district on this extensively. They can't give you the subsidy that you would be able to give your teachers and non-certificated if you own the property, okay? So you know, uh, the college district owns its sites, and so it can set the rents. Whereas if you bring in an outside developer, they've got to meet a certain internal rate of return. So they're not going to be able to subsidize their rent sure. as aggressively. And it really is that subsidized rent that the faculty and staff welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> and so back to the Crestmore Canyon question. So that's technically owned by the city of San Bruno. Yeah, let me double check on that, but uh, it's either going to be owned by the city, possibly some of it's owned by the county, but I doubt it, and then maybe some of it's been put into permanent open space. That I would have to And I think that, again, to a larger city-county conversation, uh, the opening, the southeast opening of Crestmore Canyon is, is a beautiful ecological site, and my fear, I'm just going to say this, record is that we've got to be very careful and delicate how we approach development of this area because that is such an ecological site and we can bring in um, the county the city planning um, we, we need to move thoughtful and slow no matter what we do and, and so just in and again just clarifying right now the city has jurisdiction over this and sure. so and that's what leads me to believe the city has jurisdiction over the canyon, but that's only because of its adjacency that I'm making that assumption. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a title report on the canyon. So, but, you know, it, it you know, you talk, spoke to the county and, and, you know, maybe regional, but really the city controls, has the control on this if you don't use it as a school district property. True, true. But it, say like the East Bay Regional Parks District, right, where you've got, you know, 
a variety of, of large public lands that has grazing, it has public access, it has um, trails and hiking and whatnot. So a lot of that is uh, in a trust or owned by the city, it will borders the city property, but there's also regional control and, and management. Absolutely, so, right. So that, all that needs to be considered when the Crestmore came in. I don't know if those conversations have gone on, but as we look at what we're gonna do, How many, um, sorry, for the chair, can you repeat how many entrances there are? Is it, it's, it's just one way in and out of the property it, currently? It, it's called Ingle. Okay, I've never been to this So if you, if you come up, sneak mm -hmm. here, and then you take a, a left turn, okay. generally speaking, you come down Ingle, it's a fairly long road, and then you come into the property. So it's kind of across the street from the gas station in Rollingwood? It is. Okay. Yep. Okay. It's, uh, I mean, for, it's higher yeah. up. The, fortunately, right. this is a signal controlled <laughs> intersection. Okay. So, and, and it'll, this will get a better understanding when we do our walk. But if you drive up Sneed past the gas station, this is a signalized intersection, and you get you get actually a left yeah. turn. And you need that left turn arrow. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it, one of the things, back to the tree comment, this entrance to Ingball, as you come, drive down Ingball and as you approach, the entrance to the driving range. Yes. You pass Crestmore Canyon on the right side. There's a there's a, an access gate. But that whole line, uh, imagine just looking at our map, the north end coming off 280. There's a lot of native trees there. It's almost like a kind of a forest of close to live oaks of chaparral. Um, mm -hmm. That's something we need to talk about the heritage tree policy with the city of San Bernardino. We need to understand that. Are you um, talking up in this area? I'm talking right here. So here's 280, yes. right? And so this whole entrance of Ingvall uh -huh. is really, it, it's a really delicate site because you've got the Crestmore Canyon, obviously right. we could talk about that right. all day, right. but our actual school price property at Ingvall actually has a lot of trees on it. Yes. Right? And so does, as I mentioned earlier, this southeast portion is a huge grove of coastal live oaks. And protection of this, regardless of who owns this little border right here, it's, it's the next hundred years that matter as far sure. as protecting that. Is, is that. is that part of the three acres, that, or four acres that you said is unusable? The, well, five. the five acres I said is the unusable is really lies in here. Okay. And, and, and I think uh, Member Mason, <laughs> you are, I'm gonna, I don't think this will be touched because mm -hmm. the topography is so no. steep. No. You can't really, I mean, it's, it's just, it, it has to remain. Mm -hmm. Sure, but yet, um, okay. Yeah. 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 But when we to, the, to the chair, yes. so um, to piggyback Andy's comments regarding the trees and the historical significance of the Crestmore Canyon, I'd like to read one of the emails. We received roughly about 15, 16 emails from community members regarding their support. So I'm just gonna read one and um, they pretty much said the same thing. So let me begin. I would like to express my support to have any decisions the San Bruno Park School District makes on the Ingball site. To include trail work, habitat restoration, trail to connectivity, and homage paid to the um, and like, I might chalk this up, it's not Spanish. Um, Ra Ramatiush, Ohlone tribe in the Cresmo Canyon. The canyon is a great natural and historical wonder for San Bruno and has been neglected for many years. Any deal on the adjacent Ingball site should include habitat protection and monies for improvement to the, can to the canyon. So I know that's where Andy is coming up with the Cresmo Canyon concerns and um, I'd like to piggyback on that, and also um, I support what the what our community members are saying in regards to whatever we decide that we need to make this a priority. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was I believe we may be missing uh, one of maybe perhaps the next step. Um, so before we make any decisions, I don't know when the timeline is but I believe we need to engage the community during this, with this process 
and I like to have, I feel that we need to have a couple of town hall meetings regarding, I want to hear from the community on what their, um, I don't want to use the word ideas or what they feel the possibilities are of what this land, uh, what we may use this land for. So prior to the board, uh, I really make any uh, decision on this is we need to hear from the community. So I'd like to suggest that in the next steps, perhaps after this meeting, set up a couple of town hall meetings to make that uh, next step B, and then make B a C. Mm -hmm. I like. I really like to hear from mm -hmm. you. To go from, from both um, Ms. And Ms. Blanco's comments about the eventual uses also of the land, if you could talk a little bit about the role of us as the disposal, you know, essentially the disposal, whether it's the less lease or, or the seller, versus the process that a buyer or a VC will go through with the city, which might include addressing the city's concerns on all, several of these points, right? I mean, it's that conditional use, per, whatever the process would be, would be um, as public as a school board meeting or whatever, you know, they have their own processes for how land may be used, correct? Sure, <clears throat> well, I think what you're alluding to is um, if, if the school district actually moved forward with a private sector user, that private sector user would have to enter the city process and go through all the hurdles of an, what we call an application. So, yeah. and yes, I mean, I can give you folks a very good example. Some of you know that, that in 2005, we sold the Carl Sandler site. Mm -hmm. so that was a 10 acre site. That, that's also a site that had, if you know the eucalyptus trees that are up on top, mm -hmm. so three acres were in eucalyptus trees, all three acres had to remain. So if you go to Carl Sandburg, mm -hmm. you'll see there's a park strip of three acres mm -hmm. of eucalyptus trees running behind the existing houses. And that's the same kind of process that would happen on this particular site if a private sector developer came in. and. Uh, so there would be environmental concerns. There would probably be some sort of an environmental impact report, not necessarily a full-blown EIR as we call it, but some sort of mitigated negative declaration highlighting exactly what you folks have highlighted in terms of what sort of preservation. It, it's also just to, to add on to my earlier comments, um, there's a huge knowledge gap as far as Crestmore Canyon, as far as like use by residents, right? So I got back to my regional park is that you know you have a visitor kiosk, you have a small parking lot, you maybe have maps, you maybe have some basic dawn to dusk guidelines. These are all thoughtful considerate considerations that cities and municipalities go through when they designate a park or a regionally controlled um, or managed property. So all those conversations I think should be going on with what we want to do as a district. Because obviously we have financial needs, we want to serve mm -hmm. the financial we, we know our call, but also bringing in those planners, city councilmen, regional supervisors, county parks people. All those conversations need to be um, had, and when I mention a field walk, it should be publicly noticed. We should allow the community into that decision-making process. So, what guys, I have a lot to say about this, so please chime in. So I just have a question. Um, yeah. I know you like to hike the canyon, which I want to do that someday. But I feel like I'm going to do it sooner rather than later because of our hike. I'm wondering, um, Trustee Mason, is there is this the only way into the canyon, or are there multiple entrances? I believe there's one you know, on the on the west side. I'm, I'm not sure. Through the church? Yes. I live in San Bruno for 50 years, so I've explored this canyon from each side. There are multiple access points. Every neighbor around can get access to the canyon. You can get it from Crestmore 2 and 1. So there's multiple access. When Earth Day was first established in the 1960s, one of the things was going to Crestmore Canyon and clean it out. There were inner tubes, there were tires, there was garbage, all that. Poison oak. And then it was a, they built, there's a concrete uh, flood control area. 
it wasn't there because it when it rained it come down through the canyon and fill up the lower part with the driving range and when i went to ingball we'd go on fridays and play in the mud bowl we call it and this is something so you can get many access to it there's homeless that get down in there sure. and live in there and when you get to the more western part of the canyon closest to where San Bruno Avenue is, it's very steep. There's, you'll see there's a lot of erosion that's mm -hmm. going in there and mudslides that you don't see, but it's it's full of poison oak. And then there's a stream where the Glendu fire explosion comes down through the canyon from there and cuts through it. And it's very, there's no trails in there, it's all brush. And the city is because they reestablished the Earl uh, Glendu Park, they, there's no access at that point. And before you could, you go down in there and look at it. There's multiple. You go to go down Claremont. Yeah. There's a dead end right at the base. Just walk right in there, yeah. and you get complete access. So it's yeah, easy. this is all really useful data because at the end of the day, you want to have thoughtful use mm -hmm. management. Mm -hmm. Right. Thought, thoughtful land management for the next 50, 100 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. We can look back and say we made the right decision about our school site, mm -hmm. but also we were mindful of the neighborhood. We were able to build a nice, nice trailhead right. and, and have it managed. The trail is in the canyon proper. This was part of the canyon as well, but it's the sure. floodplain of it, sure. which we don't have jurisdiction over. Yeah. It's the city. Because remember, at one time, 380 was supposed to go through there right. and then up over That's right. to Portola, That's and that got stalled. And that was because 280 was built in the 1960s. Right. And so that was another issue. So it was uh, the residents didn't want it so at that time. And so there's a lot of history in terms of what's gone in that canyon. Sure. The San Bruno explosion fire as well. I have a historical question. So you, you said that you attended Ingle Middle School. Yep. And, and, what, and what, what, what year did they did the district close that school? They closed it in let's see, Crestmore High School was closed in 1980, and Ingle closed slightly before that. I think it's 1976 or 1978. Because Crestmore High School was the high school that closed in 1980. I graduated from Crestmore in 1974. So, if you call the uh, moment. I'll give you the math. Just, just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. We're all young in this room, okay? Yeah, we are. I was 18 in 1974. Do the math. <laughs> so, if I could have another question, just um, because of the. Um, so, there's a particular context because the district has. Negotiated this window of opportunity to, to look for three years, and from all of the discussions, you know, it would be it would, it would be a thoroughgoing process before the district could do anything. So, it, would it be possible to kind of what the um, what you know what's the go slow way that still addresses that timeline? You know, that um, when should the district really be in their eye? You know, by not doing something, you're doing something. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to at least project. <clears throat> Three years feels like a long time, mm -hmm. but the city generally uses at least 18 months to two years to process a map mm -hmm. to use. So, you know, we have a little bit of slack time, but it's not like uh, you, you still have the option in, <clears throat> if you will, December of 2022 to say, oh, well, we don't have any map or approvals, but we're going to terminate the lease. Mm -hmm. So, but that's going to be difficult because you're going to lose the lease revenues from the driving range, and you're not going to have anything to replace them. So, keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, my hope was that we negotiated that termination agreement because now you can see there's substantially more value in the site than when that lease was agreed to 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to summarize, you're getting $550,000 a year for the driving range right now. And at least preliminary estimates tell me if we leased 10 acres of the site, we could get 1.3 million plus. So that's sort of been the focus I've been on to try to figure out over the three year period how we can uh, transition. transition, thank you. 
from the driving range where we have met, where we collect rents and then at the same time transition off of that into a longer term more productive lease. Mm -hmm. The other thing you should realize is that 18 months and two years to get approval doesn't mean that anything's built out here. Mm -hmm. And most tenants aren't going to be ready to pony up full rent when they haven't been able to open or start into any sort of development of the site. We can phase it in for sure. So I think we'll be able to protect your $500,000 a year, your five fifty dollars a year. But uh, I wouldn't say that we have uh, a lot of slack time in that three year timeline. Tom, quick question about Ingball Court as a road. Uh, will there be necessary improvements by the city if we would go ahead and lease the property? That, that's, I mean, I can almost 95% say the city isn't going to spend a dime. So wh whoever uses this site is going to have to improve Ingball Road. What about the adjacent curbs on the south side? It'll be a condition of the approval and the, it'll have to be done by the private okay. sector. Okay. Yeah. The, I mean, you're, you're right in what you say in terms of all these additions. But it's not going to be the city that's going to do this. Sure. It's, it's going to be the, if we negotiate a use with a private sector tenant, and then the city's going to condition the map of that private sector tenant to do those improvements. And candidly speaking, the more the conditions get laid on, the less rent that they're going to be willing to pay you. Because it's, sure. it's going to be more costly. going to be impact on the, the adjacent Crestmore area or I mean, I'm just I'm surmising here and a fundamental discussion point in that community uh, involvement is hey we we can have money for our school district mm -hmm. we can have money to do ancillary improvements yes where are our priorities absolutely One of the, the diagrams you look at it says we own that road. You do, yes. So it's going to be through the lease or any way that they sell it. So it's going to have to come from that. Yeah. The other thing I think it would be important to do is to overlay this time frame on the long term strategic plan of the district in terms of the phases of the various building projects throughout the district. Because that becomes very important in leveraging those funds in the transition so there's no impediments. Or delays in uh, the district's plan, and I think that becomes very important to see those maps in terms of timeline in order to see what's going on. So then you can make the appropriate decision based on what would be the most advantageous right. on these options to provide to come up with something else that would augment it and have a synergistic effect rather than being just out there and in isolation, right. and so you can be much more strategic and be much more potent in terms of providing uh, capital needs for the district going forward. In, in, in expanding on that, if in fact we had a, this would go out to sort of an RFP essentially to potential users, and if with the board actually elected to adopt a resolution to approve a potential user, then that user could interface with you in terms of dealing with your cash flow and your modernization needs or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, but we need to be talking to someone out there specifically because mm -hmm. it, it, it's all theoretical, including these projections right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, ha I have pretty good standing that these are fairly close. Sure. Um, Talking about a lot of things from within the community, but you could also just for a second say a, the availability of back for all of a site like this within the peninsula is also actually fairly rare now, yeah. right? I mean, it's totally rare. Mm -hmm. The ability to, I mean, to have 21 acres in San Mateo County right now that 
may be available for development is a, an, a very, very rare species. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I can't say I know where. There may be some lands east of 101 that could assemble such a piece. Very hard to get anything west of the El Camino of this size. I would also add that as you move farther down the peninsula, there's a lot of regional parks and open space. And I think there's a huge opportunity with Crestmore Canyon to say, we want a regional park here. So we would be so the county equivalent of course. Right. Right. I'm just right. speaking right. the larger yeah. community context. But it would be who would pay the district to turn that into the park. Yeah. Well, maybe I don't quite understand Trustee Mason. Did you're referring to the whole Crestmore Canyon, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so, let's assume that's under the jurisdiction of the city. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then that would be a negotiation as to whether or not the city wanted to dedicate that. Absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, and someone would have to then weigh the trade-offs of either having a city have jurisdiction or county parks. Or you know, the grant funding. There's, there's a variety of I think it really starts with the steel walk. I think that that's really critical. My colleagues. Mm -hmm. sure. It's not starting the walk from here. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I'd also make the suggestion since we often the board meet with the city council once it's found who owns the canyon, to have both the president and vice president of each city council and talk about what's it's San Bruno City that owns it mm -hmm. to address what they think they're going to do with the canyon. Because that's been, that canyon's been there in the state for over, since I've been 51 years, not too much. So that's the other priorities of the city. You know, the priority of the city says, for example, they don't want to do anything with it, it's going to leave it as it is. And then I think we have to also consider what we need mm -hmm. to the builders. And I think it would be important at both a joint meeting. Absolutely. Uh, to see, and then before you start going to the public, to know where it starts from first, for bringing it out to the public and look at the options. And, and, and if the city owns the property, then perhaps at the city council topic well, of discussion. No, it should be, but we have between the dis right. between agreements <coughs> and usually a joint, a joint meeting meeting between the president and the vice president. We've also uh, had uh, both board, the city council and the board meet in the past in the whole. So I think that. I would suggest sure. that type of in a meeting to begin with. Yeah, Absolutely. And you and uh, Kevin, and the dean and the vice chair. Um, so it's the, so the, the uh, engagement is when the um, you know, study sessions are about kind of clarifying questions that they've already been just curious. If Similarly, just clarifying yeah, questions of where we stand now. I think we'd love to right, right here, Kevin. Right. Yeah, yeah, if you can come up to the <coughs> Good evening, uh, Marty Medina, uh, San Bruno resident and city council person. The Crestmore Canyon is a city owned. It's identified in our general plan to be open space, zone for open space, and in our general plan it lists, um, or it's identified as a, a potential trail site. So it is something that, um, provided we have the funding to do it, and, and um, it's identified to be in place. So I um, wanted to give a couple clarifications on that. And I'm um, talking with staff regarding um, your questions on, on the trees and everything. Everything has a process to deal with, with cutting down the trees, heritage trees, and, and number of units, and, and all that stuff. So um, I just wanted to 
so I got a little bit of input and I welcome and look forward to this walk whenever you do have it. Excellent. Thank you. So Mick, Councilman, sure. yeah, since, since you heard our greeting, please correct me or if, if anything was misstated. I got here at okay. the very, very end of it, okay. right. um, but um, staff is um, sure willing to, to hear and, and answer whatever questions you have. Um, an environmental impact report is, prob is likely um, for whatever the change in use is going to be from that existing uh, traffic and use. Um, and it depends on where the, the parcel is, if that street is identified as being uh, dedicated to the city for public use, mm -hmm. then it would be your prop, it would be, it could be your property and, and the city's right to have those throughput that access, or it could actually just be a private road. I don't know what that is and where that would end. That would be on your parcel, and that would be also be on the uh, the improvement plan for that property. So, city staff could answer that for you as well. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, you're, you're starting to generate our timeline because, I mean, I'm walking out of here. We need a field walk. We need a larger conversation with the community, Perfect. and we need a meeting with the city. Just making sure you take your notes. Yeah. <laughs> and so, okay, great. so we would, I would like to expeditiously get that mm -hmm. on the schedule. Beautiful. And it's a, this is, we're, we're sort of in the evolution stage right now because this is your first study session. Mm -hmm. So what I have envisioned is we'll collect more information and we'll come back for another study session. Mm -hmm. Um, the only thing I'd like to mention is I appreciate Councilmember Medina here. <coughs> when he said more than likely it will be an EIR, an EIR is a sub takes a substantial amount of time to complete. So that just compresses our three years, you know, even that much uh, tighter. And I don't want you to be overly obsessive. At the end of that three years, like I said, we can terminate the lease if you're ready to, but um, we're trying to have you that lease synchronized with some sort of revenue flowing in sure. once it's terminated. So that's, just keep that in the back of our mind as we try to go forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more thing. I'd like to propose that we have one in the flats of the city and one up on the hill. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, item B two, Measure X projects, capital uh, projects. So good evening. Uh, we have uh, with us this evening um, our um, t part of our team that is uh, working on the Measure X projects, and so I'd like to open this up for Wendy to introduce the team and to talk a little bit about uh, what you'll hear this evening. We are going to have um, our representatives from DWK. We have Marilyn Cleveland and Lauren Shemansky. I probably pronounced it wrong, but um, they're both going to come up and they're going to give you um, information on the roles and responsibilities of the board and uh, a little bit for the, uh, the um, Citizens Oversight Committee just some information that you know, the board should be aware of um, while, while we're going through this bond program and what it is to kind of anticipate, what to look forward to, and all the rules and regulations that go around having this bond program. So if you two ladies would like to come up, please. Marilyn has hard copies of our presentations for the board members. I have copies as well for members of the public, if anyone would like one. Thank you.
this is, again, it's part of the study session, so I think you can kind of be on, on the order of questions, like clarify, clarify questions, but members of the public would like to address the board on that. If you could talk the yellow cards that are demonstrated yeah. in the back, um, yeah, it would help us to, to manage the... Thank you. Mr. President, members of the board, members of the public, we appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Um, we are here, first of all, to congratulate you on the passage of Measure X, um, and secondly, to give you a little bit of a foretaste of some things to come in the process. And we're going to focus more on the most immediate steps and then as we move out into the future, it's much more general because you'll have other opportunities to look at those areas. So we're going to talk about roles and responsibilities and then sort of the three general phases, the planning phase, design phase, and construction phase of the program. So starting off with roles and responsibilities, the key elements for the board are that you will be receiving regular reports usually monthly, but whatever the frequency is, depending on what's going on at that point. And this will include regular updates on the budget and schedule for your program. Um, your program may include many projects. So, you know, there's the program level and then the project level. And, and that's one of the things to sort of think about as you're going through. Are you looking program level or are you looking project level as you're getting reports and information? You will be asked to consider and take action on contracts and amendments to contracts. This includes in the near term looking at program management and construction management and on architects to do the design work. And then as you move forward, you will probably need a CEQA consultant, CEQA being the California Environmental Quality Act. And you've already been hearing about that in the context of, of property matters. But in this case, it would be the <coughs> district's projects would also require that. And then you will have builders and contractors, inspectors, and other types of consultants coming before you. The role of the Bond Oversight Committee, I know you've already been through the process of selecting your Bond Oversight Committee. They will be receiving information provided by staff and the Bond team, and they'll be reviewing that information in annual and final financial and performance audits. Those same audits will come be coming to you, of course, for your consideration. That oversight committee will be expected to prepare an annual report to the board and the community and present it to you, giving you their perspective on the status and progress of the bond program. And they are expected to be an independent group looking at the, the program and from their perspective how it is operating. It is not their role to make decisions or to advise. They are more like an after the fact look at decisions that you are making. If they are participating in making those decisions, then that's sort of a conflict with their real role, which is to do sort of oversight um, and just watch how things are going. And then, of course, you have your staff and your bond team who have the major role of the day-to-day -day operation and supervision of the program. And it's their job to bring issues and decisions to the board as needed, but also to make those decisions that keep things going day-to-day. Um, because very often there are decisions that need to be made more frequently and faster than waiting for the next board meeting. It's their job to facilitate communication among all parties and provide timely responses, let you know what's going on. It's their responsibility to resolve issues as they arise so that things can keep going, um, to keep the community informed and to of course, complete the projects on time and within budget. That's, that's the goal. So turning then to the planning phase. So the planning phase is where the district is right now. And just for a little bit of context, 
with your program schedule, we're talking about everything under Measure X. And this particular Measure X bond program will have a lifespan that's multiple years long. Most bond programs are somewhere within five to seven years, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, so when we talk about planning, you're planning for the life of that whole program. Um, so your program schedule, and this is not just for one project, but for everything that's going to happen, is something that your bond team develops in concert with your staff. Um, there are a lot of different moving parts and components to this bond schedule. You're trying to marry many different timelines together, and a few examples are here. Just building your bond team, like your program management, construction management, designer procurement, um, finalizing your project list, because as we all know, the measure language has broad language and um, a lot of possibilities, but um, I've never met a bond program where they were able to fund every single item that they wanted to do with a single bond measure. That's just the reality is that now is the fine tuning for setting scope, prioritizing and getting that plan in place. Uh, because your project scope is going to influence your CEQA compliance and CEQA approach. Uh, so you'll be finalizing that, working with your CEQA consultant and getting that piece fit in to see what that timeline is like. Kind of piggybacking off of some of the earlier discussion, an EIR does take a much longer period of time to complete than a mitigated net debt or a notice of exemption. So these are all moving pieces that the bond team will kind of go out there, get the due diligence done, and report back to the board um, as that schedule is developed. Other components include further down the road, finalizing project delivery selection, and your actual construction of your projects in this you know, multi-year program that we have. So slicing this a little bit finer, we've gone from the program of all Measure X projects to just a single project. The difference here, we still have a little bit of planning. Let's say we're looking at one particular construction project. You have a little bit of planning still, because you're really piggybacking off of all this initial program planning that was done. You'll finalize the design with your architect, go through bidding, go through construction, and close the project out. This example just has your typical project components. It assumes that you're using a pretty standard hard bid design, bid, build, project delivery mechanism. Um, your bond team can talk with you about other delivery options later on. They're all basically going to have these same components, but they might have slightly different timelines and it might be in a slightly different order. Keeping in mind that we're now looking at a project level view, this is a very helpful consideration to keep in mind for the life of your program, um, which is we have cost increasing on the left and time progressing on the right. The big takeaway here is the longer that it takes to finalize your decision, the more likely it is you're going to be paying a higher cost for that. Or if you make a decision and go back and change it later down the line, the more likely it is you're going to be paying a premium doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's to keep in mind, um, as Marilyn put it the other day, I think it's a lovely way to phrase it, you really want to be comfortable living with the decisions you make um, to avoid paying those premium costs later. And you see it a lot on a per project basis. You can see it at the program level too, but part of why planning is really important, building a good bond team up front. So as one of the components of your bond team, we're getting into program management. Program management, I know the board has heard this before, so I won't belabor it, but it's the high level program wide oversight, budget reconciliation, budget development, scheduling, coordination, project sequencing and phasing. These are not necessarily the same folks who will be out at every single project site, um, keeping your contractor on schedule, making sure the progress payments get sent out. But these are the people looking at your overall program and making sure that from a higher level, the pieces are working together in the way they should. Um, they will interface with the district staff to make sure that the bond, I'm sorry, that the board is getting appropriate information updates, um, the progress, the status, 
and everything that's going on with the bond program. It's a qualifications based selection. Um, as you know, an RFQ and an RFP are not required. Interviews are not required, but the district did that here. Um, they've exceeded the legal requirements for getting these people on your team. And I will say, it is a, having program management is common on a bond program. This, on this earlier side where we talk about examples of program schedule components, these are just a few high level examples. Um, if, if we went through everything, it'd be a mess of different timelines that we're trying to coordinate for the district. Your program manager is really going to be taking point on that in conjunction and with the oversight of district staff. Um, so having a program manager on your team, common. Something that they're expected to be there for the life of your program. You're really only going to have one program manager for, your, for Measure X because that's really the scope of what they're there to do. Um, I've, I've never seen two program managers on the same bond program before. The, the scope doesn't really work out that way. Um, so the way that that works is generally they'll be procured. Um, and if necessary, there could be an amendment with a contract extension. If the bond program um, goes on for longer than anticipated, that's something that's commonly done. One of the other key components for your bond program and to help you develop that program schedule is your implementation plan and your project list. Every district has different needs and different priorities. And as with any other district with a bond program, your bond team is going to help review those priorities and assess what they are. Sometimes there can be some limited community outreach to help identify what a district's priorities are. Um, and then your bond team can take that community feedback and help that inform what they recommend as the project list, um, which is what you'll use to implement your actual bond program. Um, you know, it's usually by, by project you can get feedback or even priorities across the entire program. The key thing with your implementation plan or your project list is that this is really getting you set up to identify your project scopes, which is going to trickle down into how you approach CEQA, which consultants you'll need, what the timing is, when you might be able to start construction, um, you know, when you need to think about finalizing project delivery. Is there a little bit of you know, influence in how and when the next um, section on this timeline moves forward? Once you move a little further along and you're closer to construction, your construction management team will be working with your program <coughs> management team and your district staff to be out on site managing a specific construction project. So your PM is thinking globally about your bond program, the overall program budget, all the projects all together. Your CM, they're really focused on one particular project. They're the ones out there getting the, con the general contractor, making sure, hey, are these guys here on site? What's going on with the schedule? Where's my look ahead? Um, I want to make sure all the paperwork's in order um, so we can process this payment and let's make sure everything's running smoothly. Your procurement for CM, again, qualifications based. Um, and the district here did a similar process with the RFQP interviews and exceeded all the legal requirements to really dive deep into this. Um, for CM work, it is possible for your CM firm to be the same as your program manager, as long as you time the procurement correctly. If it's done at the same time, that's fine. Um, but if you have a um, program manager on board, and then a year down the road you say, oh, we think they might want to do this, the CM work on a specific project, that can create issues. So sometimes your PM firm and your CM firm are the same. Sometimes you'll have a pool or a panel of firms that you can tap and say, give us a proposal. And sometimes you'll have one CM firm for the entire project, or the entire program, rather. It, it depends on the district, the number of projects, the timing, and everything else that feeds into this. It's really what fits your needs um, for San Bruno Park School District. So next we have architects. Yeah. And 
just to clarify, when we talk about your bond program, this is funded at least in part, of course, by your bond fund, but it can also be funded in part by other funds, whether that's surplus property funds or state funds. So one of the things you'll be wanting to do is meet the requirements for state funding to the extent we know them so that you can be in line for that, which very often these days is a reimbursement rather than an advanced funding. But it's, it's something to keep in mind so that you can stretch your bond dollars as far as possible by using those other dollars that may be available. So to talk about architects, they're selected during the planning phase but do their work on a specific project during the design phase. Um, their role subject to program manager and district oversight is really to design projects, which is a multi-step process during which they will be getting community input and then coming back to the board with the design as it is gradually refined throughout that process. And as it is refined, the design is refined and the budget is refined until you get to a point that you've got a budget that you're pretty comfortable with, they're pretty comfortable with. And then you actually procure your contracts for construction and during the construction, they have a continuing <coughs> role of responding to questions about the design and looking at the, to make sure that the design itself is being followed and um, clarifying where necessary. They also served as the district's liaison with the Division of the State Architect. As was mentioned earlier, the district's under the division, under the, the jurisdiction of the State Division of, um, of the State Architect, DSA, rather than under local city jurisdiction. And you want to have an architect that's experienced in school design for many reasons, but one of those is so that they will know how to work with DSA throughout the project and get you the final clearance so that once you get that final DSA approval and you've closed out the project, then there's not continuing board member liability were there anything that was a problem on the project, whereas if you don't get DSA close out, there can be future board member liability and district liability for that. So again, your, your architects are selected. <laughs> There's insurance to cover. Yeah, that. I, mean, I was going to say about board member liability. Can you yeah. tell us more about that? Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make sure you all were really right. listening right. to me. Listening. Yeah. 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 So they again are selected on a qualifications basis, um, a competitive selection process, but not required to be an RFQ or RFP. So the district has gone beyond what's required in this. And um, again, it can be a panel or pool of firms um, or a single firm. Um, the next phase, of course, is the design phase. And the design phase is more a project by project phase. Um, phase. So you may have one project that's in design phase and when that project goes into construction phase you may have another project that's in design phase so each project has a design phase one of the things that will happen during the design phase is your CEQA compliance and the reason that has to be during the design phase is that you have to have a project description you have to have your architect on board and have them have enough of an idea of what the project is to be able to provide a project description. And then they can assist you and you know, your program manager and other consultants and the CEQA consultant can assist you in making the determination as to what kind of CEQA can, um, process you need to go through. And we've mentioned the three basic kinds. You may need a full environmental impact report, which can be 12 to 18 months. It's a very extensive project. And if you have any, if a project has any significant environmental impacts that can't be reduced to a level of less than significant by mitigation measures, then you would need to do a full EIR. 
if you have only impacts that can be reduced to a level of less than significant by mitigation measures, then you can do a mitigated negative declaration, which is a shorter process. Um, and if there are no significant environmental impacts, then you can either do a negative declaration, and if your project is within certain identified categories of exemptions, and these are either within the statutes or the regulations, they're specified, then you can do an exemption. Um, and the purpose of doing your CEQA compliance is that if you go through the process properly, then you have a very short statute of limitations or time within which it can be challenged. So usually that's 30 days for a, a notice of exemption, it's 35 days. And what you accomplish by going through this process and meeting these requirements is that then you can be assured that somebody can't come back five or six months later and challenge the CEQA compliance with the environmental aspects of the project. Your design phase, just to look ahead, your bond team will be assessing your future project delivery options and they will be giving you information about what those options are and a recommendation and it will be, you know, you will have a part in that decision as to what, how you want your projects actually delivered. So that's something to look forward to. It will be coming back to you as options. You're going to be getting more detail about this as your planning phase concludes. There are other design phase consultants who will be brought on board to work on various aspects. You're going to have project inspectors, also called inspectors of record or IORs. There is a requirement that you have an inspector on every project. Their job is to make sure that the regulations governing construction of schools are followed. So they have a very specific role and they have, they are reporting to DSA, the Division of the State Architect. And they're another watchman you have on the project to make sure the job is done correctly. So they, they help you, but their job is to make sure that the regulations are followed. It's sort of the equivalent of the building code that the city has. These are the state regulations for building a school in Title 24. And um, so then you'll also probably need a surveyor an environmental assessor, the environmental assessor is responsible for looking at whether there are any hazardous materials on the site and doing any interaction with DTSC, the Department of Toxic Substance Control, which has jurisdiction over school sites and whether there are any environmental factors or hazardous materials to be looked at. And then you have a SWIFT consultant, which is for your stormwater pollution prevention plan testing laboratories, a geotech consultant. So as you can see, there's going to be a cast of characters on your overall bond team. And with that, then we move into the construction phase. So construction phase uh, seems like a far away away, but you will get there maybe sooner than you think um, as you start getting all these updates. Looking ahead without diving too deep, your bond team, after kind of coming forward with those project delivery methods, um, will be moving forward with what has been selected. We talk about project delivery, it's really how you're, you're setting up the responsibilities for a particular project. The, the most common and, or maybe more traditional approach is design, bid, build. Your architect designs it, bid it out to everyone, and then it gets built by your contractor. There are a few other types of project delivery methods um, that are used commonly in, in public school construction. And without getting too in the weeds, you, you'll hear about that, you'll hear about the timelines, and those will start getting moving forward once you're actually in construction phase. Um, so again, you'll be getting more detail about all of that in the design phase, what the bond team would recommend and thinks is well matched for a particular project. So other factors to consider and to be aware of in the construction phase. Um, all of your projects are public works projects, so all of them are subject to prevailing wage. Um, there will be references to certified payroll 
payroll records. And the good news is the contractor sends those directly to the state. Mm. Um, way you know, back in the day, the district used to have to do a lot of extra paperwork, but now the state does that. Um, there may be the use of a project labor agreement. This is something that come, would come up maybe during the design phase, closer in construction uh, discussion with your bond team. Sometimes it's called project stabilization. It's optional. Um, some districts use it and some don't. It's really based on what your needs are. And then, uh, as Marilyn referenced before, qualifying for state funding. This is something that the district will want to keep in mind throughout your prep and your construction process. If you want to be eligible or if you qualify for state funding, there are a few key things that you need to make sure you do. Um, competitive selection of your consultants, like with your architect. Uh, the pre-qualification of contractors. This is uh, an, basically an informational packet that, that's put together. It'll be submitted to the board, um, assuming that you want to adopt it and that you want to maintain eligibility for state funding. And then that goes out. It's very standard. Uh, a lot of contractors are, are used to it. Um, have some basic background information, safety record, things like that, financial stability. Um, and then use of the DVBE goal, which is a disa Disabled Veteran Business Enterprise Goal. Um, and that's kind of an additional form that will work its way into your contract document so that best efforts are used for outreach for those types of uh, companies to have them involved in your projects and get a certain level of participation. There are a few other requirements as well, um, but those are the big ones for state funding eligibility. And then at the bottom there, we have alphabet soup, also known as <laughs> CUPCA, which is the Californ California Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act. So with additional accounting um, <coughs> transparency, school districts are excused from some, or some of the public bidding requirements are made a little more flexible for certain projects based on the project estimate. And the district here has adopted CUPCA, so you have notified the state controller, um, and this was something that was previously done. Once, once entered into, it, you're there, you can withdraw if you want, but the accounting practices are very standard to what most school districts use. It's kind of cost code accounting. Um, but there comes a little bit of flexibility with regard to bid threshold limits which can help make your process more efficient, help you save a little bit of money. Um, and it's most ideal for some of your smaller projects under $200,000 or even under $60,000. But that's one thing to keep in mind. You might hear cup cut again down the road. Um, that takes care of the big picture items for construction phase. And we just wanted to know if anyone has questions or points of discussion. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my questions were, um, and a lot of these have been answered through your presentation. Um, my understanding is that we've got three action items tonight. Are you able to speak on those action items? The D1, 2, and 3? I think we can be available to... Does it relate pretty much directly to one, the bond program manager, second, school qualified construction managers, and the third is Alan. Yes, and, okay. and we, can, we can respond to any questions about those. Yeah, as they come up. As they come up. Okay. Um, my uh, third question was, um, and I'm supportive of this, I'm just one of five, we, we have to vote together, but uh, when do we make a decision on supporting a PLA to support a local trade union? That can be considered during your planning phase or later on during design phase. Okay. Presumably before you get into the construction phase because it, it affects who your contractors are and if you decide to do that, it becomes part of their contract. Okay. Is that, did, did the chair wanted to clarify, is that, I think it's page 26 where it says um, state's project labor agreement being optional, is that, is that kind of what you're- That's what I'm getting, I just wanna know the like right. the time gate, uh, when, when, timeline. the timeline, when we, the board would uh, push for that, advocate for that, um, to support the PLA. It can be done during the planning phase or during, between planning and design, but before you're ready to enter into a construction. Right, I got you. 
And it is helpful to have a developed project scope or project list that frequently informs some of the terms and the parameters that you negotiate on a PLA. Um, it, it could, if, if you wanted every project included under a PLA, that could actually make it very difficult to get certain types of projects done if it's just a small HVAC or something like that. Um, so that's a, a practical concern about um, revisiting a PLA or PSA once you have your project list uh, developed. Sure, but you could kind of define by scope, like as far as dollar amount, an HVAC unit, $5,000 versus $40,000, yes. mm -hmm. right? And, and we can come back or your program manager can give you information, but we've certainly provided information to many districts about the pros and cons. So you're hearing both sides, making, and, and it's a multi-step process because first it would be, do you want to consider it and consider negotiating with the unions and then whoever is your you know, representative to do so would then negotiate with the unions and develop the agreement. So it's, it's developed between the district and whoever the unions are that are involved and then that would become something that would be part of the contract documents that would go out to any contractors who were thinking of either bidding or proposing, depending on the banner you use, on specific projects. Sure, okay, okay. thank you. Um, as far as use of the program manager for the bond, um, is there data on neighboring districts here in the peninsula that uses um, when they pass a bond, do they use a program manager? Is, it, is this typical? Can you speak I, I mean, I'm, I'm working with a district on the peninsula who's using a program manager. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon. And is there a sunset period for that contract? Because essentially we're entering in the district, we're entering in a contract for the program manager role. I imagine that contract has a sunset. Well, normally contracts for services are up to five years, mm -hmm. but it can be renewed because normally the expectation is you would have a program manager for the life of the program. I was gonna, this is Sheriff, gonna, did you mention earlier at the beginning that the Measure X, pro, Measure X projects might be five to seven years or would it be longer, the, that, the initial phase or? That was just a general okay. estimate of what some programs okay. run, yours okay. may take Less time, they may take okay. more time. Okay. And we really don't know a schedule until you get, you know, whoever it is who is going to develop your program, your project list, and, and your program schedule. But generally speaking, it'll be five to seven years. Okay. Very often it's five to seven years. That, that's a common range, but yeah, it's still a range, and there could be room on either side. Mm -hmm. I have a question in terms of the, as you know, in the state of California for construction projects for schools have gone to the wayside. And now with the $21 billion in this uh, uh, budget year, they're trying to figure out what to do for this budget cycle. <coughs> when you say about the state funding for facilities, mm -hmm. what's the likelihood of them providing money if they were going through this that we would we can qualify for it, but at the end result, when will the money arrive, if it ever does? <laughs> it's going to be a little while. <laughs> so the, the last state bond, Prop 51, those funds are being depleted, and they've been depleted more slowly than they otherwise would because our prior governor was very slow about allowing the issuance of the bonds. So while the money had been approved, it was taking some time, but there was a huge backlog because it had been 10 years since the prior bond. And already the new construction funds have all been basically committed. Um, there still is some modernization money not yet committed. And there is an organization that is looking at putting another state bond on the 2020 ballot. So it's called the Coalition for Adequate School Housing. And um, so there's a possibility there'll be a 2020 bond. There's also word from 
the current governor, Governor Newsom, that he will be allowing bonds to be issued more quickly. So the money that is there may start flowing slightly faster. But yes, it will be quite a while before you'll see any big money, probably. Did you say estimate greater than five years or less than five years? You had to take a guess. I, I would say it's all, it all depends. Because in order, <laughs> Good answer. In order to get in line, yeah. you have to have your site, and you, of course, have your site. And you have to have your plans approved by DSA. So that means you have to go through, you have to select your architect, go through the design phase, get your plans to DSA, go through a waiting period until your plans come up for DSA approval, get them approved, and then you can get in line for funding. Okay. And there's you know, a yeah. backlog. There's a, a backlog. A long backlog factored into that is also your CEQA lead time before you finalize the design. Right. So there are, there are a few steps. We're, we're not trying to be too cagey on no, this. No, no. Because yeah. I, I think the way this has been set up in the state of California has been uh, a roller coaster ride, yes. especially on the infrastructure needs, like our district. Because mm -hmm. the aging infrastructure is throughout the state and our school district and how to deal with that. And then obviously local communities like ourselves doing bond measures. And the state funding is set up as matching funds. So in order to get the state funds, you have to have a local source to provide the match. So now that you have your local voters saying you can do you know, work on your, with your local money, you can expand that to some extent with the state money. But it may well be that you have to do what you can do with the local money and the state money will come in as a reimbursement and then, you know, you can plan what to do with that once it comes in. And patience is what Patience. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Persistence. Persistence, persistence and patience. patience. I would say persistence is the key ingredient. I was just going to say thank you. This was very inform informative, <laughs> except for the board liability part. <laughs> <laughs> things, elements that might even resemble some things that might be common in pressure paper agreements or something, but is that common to have like those kinds of things that sort of like the rule, the, like I know earlier we had things like we would prefer to have, we, we found we couldn't do it, but prefer to have local labor if possible, and then discover that all that, but those kinds of, those conversations, you know, those kinds of local touches or questions, mm -hmm. how, you know, Okay. You felt like a, a good way to approach those kinds of things. You know, yeah. So, so this is a process that is governed by state law, but it is also something that allows each district to make certain decisions. I mean, the, the decisions about what projects you're going to do and how you're going to deliver them are key ingredients in this program, and they're something you decide. I mean, you have control of your budget, you have control of your schedule, you have control of what projects are you going to do. Um, one of the issues that I hear from districts is, okay, are we going to do everything to one school first and then the next school, or are we going to do you know, a certain scope of work for each of our schools? And you know, so what, how you do your, how you plan out your program is really a local, decision as to how do you meet the needs of your district given the fact that your funds are not going to do everything you want to do uh, from this bond. But doing the best you can and showing you know, you're good stewards and you're, you're creating something good for the students is going to then hopefully provide more opportunities to keep working in ways to Some of that then, like you say, is the, the, um, there's a subset of that that can be done within the current bond program, but that 
screwing up. In other words, not a not saying um, in uh, June that let's hurry up and get something on the ballot in November because we see that there's this backlog, you know, or this mm -hmm. unmet need. But other ways to make it, <coughs> you know, where the role is of construction inflation or you know what it's doing to us and knowing that. And as we go, you know, mm -hmm. and like, I'm sorry. And there's some like over the entire set of capital needs, mm -hmm. you know, that may or may not be addressed by the bond. You know. I, and that's one of the key topics that I think your program manager is going to be giving you assistance on is the development of that larger program budget, which is going to help as your as project scopes are being developed project budgets need to be developed. Construction escalation, that's a, that's a great point to bring up. That has to be factored in in today's market. Um, contingency needs to be factored in. And so understanding what the district's priorities are and what options there are for focusing funds on a flagship project or dividing them into uh, a multi-project approach. Those are those are things your program manager and your bond team. They're gonna do a lot of that initial hard thinking and come back and bring that analysis in a really digestible form for the board so that you can work off of that and move forward and make decisions. Um, you know, some districts might, you know, they know they have a big project that's gonna take a while to get there, so they might wanna do a quick start project. Um, you know, repaint one of their buildings, maybe Put up some lunches or something else. And that's one strategy, and that might work for one district, it might not work for you. But your program manager has experience with that, and they're going to be able to come with options and have all that detail to make sure that things are running on budget. And just lastly, just to confirm that, because I don't think it was explicit, was that the, the specialties that are um, contained within are legitimate uses of bond <laughs> okay, so any consultants, contractors, others who are hired to work on the bond program are legitimate bond expenses can be charged to the bond. In addition, staff time that is devoted to bond work can be charged to the bond. So if, if of your staff, somebody is spending 30% of their time on the bond, then 30% of their salary can be charged to the bond. So whatever is directly related to the bond program can be charged to the bond. And that includes the bond accounting work. And that, that includes any staff. <laughs> yes. And so that being the most restricted money, that, would, that for a principal would use the most restricted money first, say compared to yes. the general fund things, mm -hmm. would probably be <coughs> The chair, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, just because they're doing 30% of the work is you can charge it to the bond dollars, but it doesn't necessarily mean that their, their salary can be increased, right? It should. No, this is okay. an allocation of. Yeah. Just want to make that clear. The, the sources of funding for <coughs> salary. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that, but just in yes. case anyone was asking that question. I have one final question. Um, in slide two, you mentioned uh, annual report to the board and community on status and progress. Um, is this a, an auditable report? Will an external auditing accounting firm audit that, or is it more of just a report to us? Okay, there, there are two different things. One is you will be getting regular reports, and then in the same way that you get an annual financial audit on your general operations, you will be receiving an annual financial audit on the bond funds. And very often that's done by the same CPA firm as is doing your general audit, um, but that is called out to be separately identified. In addition, there is a requirement since you used a Prop 39 bond where you were able to have it approved by 55% of the voters, that you have an annual performance audit, which is again 
usually done by someone outside of the district that can be the same firm that's doing your financial audit. It can be someone else who specializes in doing performance audits. But it's basically someone who is looking to see what projects that you're billing for was the work actually done. Mm -hmm. So it, and it's, so it's not how well was the work done, but was the work performed that is for which the funds are being spent. And that's something that both the board and the oversight committee will be looking at as part of, and it's part of the oversight's information, oversight committee's information that they then use to put together their annual report. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. to address the board on items that are not on the agenda. First, thank you for opening this up to the community. <coughs> this was incredibly informative. Um, just on slide six, bullet five, the role of staff and bond team is to keep community informed. I just want to emphasize this. Um, this community hasn't passed the bond in 20 years. Yes. So Measure X, um, being a member of this community for longer than that, it's, it's significant. And if we anticipate putting another bond up or a parcel tax up, the community needs to be comfortable with how we're spending existing funds. I think Trustee Mason had a suggestion of the billboards, the new gymnasium brought to you by Measure X. Things like that, newsletter updates, social media posts, since that's where most people get their communication these days. Um, I just think that that's really critical, and as we increase fundraising for the district, it's going to be impacted by this as well. Because if there is a perception that funds were not used properly, people aren't going to want to donate or pass another bond or parcel tax. So just emphasizing that bullet. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, I didn't also do any trick for, for anybody pushing to address the board on items that are not on the agenda, so. Here. Okay. Thank you. Then we'll move on to um, special meeting item D1, our action items. Uh, D1 is consideration of authorization of staff to pursue negotiation of Measure X bond program manager consistent with <coughs> RFQ slash P number 004. Okay, um, I have to let you know that uh, last board meeting in January that I had told you that there were eight um, proposals that were received for the PMCM um, uh, proposal that we had sent out, the RFQP. Um, unfortunately, it was actually seven. And I have them listed, um, the information that was um, added to the board agenda. So we did uh, receive seven proposals, and you can see them listed there. They're not ranked in any order how they're listed. Um, so each of the proposals were reviewed by a team of three people, including Dr. Uh, Kemp, myself, and um, Rick Champion, and he is the CEO from Millbrae. Um, besides him being the CBO for Millbury in his prior to that, he had his own construction company and he had been in there for um, over 17 years of running the business. So he had a good expertise as far as construction is concerned. So we really valued his opinion as when we went through the ranking process. And you can see the criteria that we used for the ranking of our firm, uh, of the, all the firms that um, gave the proposals. Uh, responsiveness to the um, RFQP, meaning we wanted to make sure that what we had requested in that uh, proposal, um, they actually followed through. They gave us all the requirements that were in there. Um, and then we also asked them to give us project references. 
So we wanted to see what kind of projects that they had been working on and given us the ability to call on them and get information from them too. Um, the firm's qualifications was another criteria. We looked at uh, what they had done in prior years uh, the, the, on those projects, how were they um, for those. And then we also looked at their um, firm performance history. We wanted to know the history, how, how long have they been in business, what have they been doing, what kind of projects did they do, were they just all small ones, did they work on um, K-12, did they include uh, community colleges, all those kind of things. Um, we also looked at who they said were going to be the proposed project team. And that came into play when um, calling on references and to say, okay, a lot of times they'll say these are the, the best people we're having to bring out to your interview so that you can talk to them. But yet when the, you go down to the nitty gritty and you're working, it might not be the same people. And so we were wanting, uh, that was one of the other criteria we looked at. We also looked at their technical capabilities and we also always, you need to look at their litigation history. If they have had a lot of problems, you wanna make sure that you're looking at that too. And um, the, food, the fee proposal. So after the, um, doing that rating, <clears throat> and it did take us a while because there were seven firms and they all gave us nice proposals to look at. We um, cornered and we brought them down to only four that we believe were really qualified to do us. And we, as you can also see here, I made sure to pick, when I called wrong references, I made sure to pick a different school district, even though these firms may have worked on the same school district <laughs> on different projects, I made sure to look at a different school district when I called, because I, I wanted to get different opinions and not necessarily the same person for the same um, for, um, school district. So you can see how many, I uh, contacted 12 of them and you can see the range of school districts. Some of them are unified, some of them were uh, K-8s like ours and um, they're just all over the place as far as uh, the references are concerned. And after doing that extensive phone calling and, and some of them emailing and talking with these people, um, the one thing that really came, stood out when I was asking about the program management manager is they all told me it really depends on your team. Who do you have on your team? Who is going to really work for you? And almost every single person that I talked to, that's what they said. After doing that, I am recommending to the board that we have Greystone West as our program manager. The, he, that firm received the highest quality referenced um, from all of the people that I had talked to. Um, even ones that I even didn't talk to, they told me, you know who you need to call? You need to call Todd Lee. So that really gave me uh, high quality marks for that particular firm. And I believe that that would be our best selection for us this evening. And that is what I am recommending to the board for our program manager, it to be very strong West. To the chair, so moved. I second that. I wanna clarify the motion is for us to pursue negotiations of a contract with uh, Greystone for uh, for the program management services. So we will be bringing a contract back to the board later. Are they, um, for questions? Um, um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned here, Rick Champion, if you can share with us um, how he came involved with this process. Well, I contacted about three people, um, uh, uh, colleagues throughout uh, San Mateo County, and um, Tim Ryan of uh, San Mateo Foster City, and also um, 
It was, it was, it wasn't Liz McManus, but it was her uh, director of facilities. Um, I asked him also. Unfortunately, they were not able to participate, but um, I had also uh, contacted Rick, and because I had known that he was, uh, prior to being the CBO, that he had ran his own construction company, so I knew that he would have um, a good uh, feeling of what it takes to be construction and what to look for when looking at the proposals also. Um, and it mentions here questions. Uh, how many questions were, were asked? For the, oh, I, I didn't tell you that. We did have an interview. We interviewed all four, um, uh, four of the firms and we brought them in and I think we had about 10 questions that we asked them and it was uh, a round table type uh, situation um, and we wanted to get the feel of those firms. We wanted to hear, uh, we have their proposals so we could read everything, but you also need to hear it from the, the firms themselves. And um, I would say it was probably about 10 questions that we asked. Can you share with us um, some of those questions that were asked? Uh, see what we, we asked questions like, um, what, what is your rate of having change orders? Um, on the projects that you did, were, did you come in on uh, under budget or in budget range? Um, how was the scheduling? Were you always having to schedule uh, because something came up? And um, some of the other ones was school safety. School safety, because we that was you're right. Um, one of the questions that we did ask, since we know that we're going to have Allen, and the way that we're going to probably build Allen will the, the students will still be on campus. So we wanted to know what their track record was of that and how they handled that. And we also asked questions related to how do you engage the students in that because it's such a great STEM opportunity is, do you have any experience of you know, engaging the students so that they can see the, the, mm -hmm. the work that's going on and how do you, you know, create a learning opportunity out of that? My only question is, um, I know we approached this one in January uh, and we were, the board was asked to approve an architect and a construction company. Please remind me of who was for that, uh, that time frame. I'm not sure what you're asking. So Greystone was, was a recommended yes. firm okay. in, when we came in January. So here we are yes. in March and we're, we're picking this yes. over. Right, right. Okay. Which leads me to my either question or comment <coughs> on that. We did do a competitive, yeah. we yeah. did go That's back right. out right. as as the board had uh, requested. We did go out, we did receive those seven other um, mm -hmm. proposals. We did review them both uh, doing a rating system and interviewing, and we came after all of those um, items, we came to the same conclusion that Greystone West would be the one that we would um, like to negotiate a contract with. Mm -hmm. Any other so, questions? Mm -hmm. To the chair, I just want to make a comment. Um, I, I want to thank you for the process that you've done, because in January, I was in January, it was the January meeting, right, right Trustee Mason? Yes. Ja yeah, I wasn't quite comfortable since we received one um, response, but we received seven great responses and you interviewed four um, great firms. And, you, and you, now you're, I feel really comfortable with this because you're sharing a lot of information, a lot of details, so thank you. Were, were there questions up for me on Because um, I want to also allow the public to oh. comment. I didn't see any comments, but we're saying Now we'll close, and now if there's other comments, you know, deliberation of the board, so before taking the vote. I'd also ahead. like to thank um, Trustee Chavez. Yes, thank you again for doing your due diligence and bringing forth several companies, um, and then continue on with that evaluation process. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, thank you for the attentions. Um, so what I wanted to say was my concerns with moving forward with approving Greystone West, I, I do know that we do have a history with Todd who's here with us tonight and um, my, my concerns are, are uh, all the 
uh, situation that were that came up under when they were doing uh, I've mentioned this already before a previous meeting regarding all um, uh, the, the problems that came up uh, and in speaking with past administration and past uh, employee uh, staff at the school um, there was a lot of um, concerns and, and, and um, uh, complaints regarding um, Kirsten West being um, the construction management group and also my other concern is approving Greystone West and being that they were one of the top donors for the uh, Measure X campaign, um, just the way that this was presented the first time around and the fact that they are coming back and they're the ones who are being chosen, that is a concern um, for myself as an individual board member. And if they are the one who's going to be chosen, um, I would just strongly suggest that, um, that they are vigilant and truly oversee that um, any and all um, situations that might arise or problems that might arise, um, that it won't be such um, an issue for the uh, school staff. Um, but again, I, I said it before at the other meeting, it just does not look like that we are approving, that we are going to be approving Greystone West uh, moving forward, knowing that, they're, that they were one of the top donors of um, the bond campaign. Okay. I would like to thank Wendy Stella and the CBO from Millbury for their, uh, I think they've done a, a very outstanding job of thoroughly vetting the various um, proposals that were submitted in the interview process. And I feel very comfortable with the so less, uh, despite comments from others. I think this becomes very important that uh, we've got a good construction management forum that will move forward, especially in light of the construction uh, projects that are looking forward to the district will be positive. Was the ability we had to see, uh, um, sort of happy coincidence, you had to see uh, the project at uh, Puerto Madera that's right, that's right. School District. That's right. but, and, uh, you know, I, part of the leading to that um, project that had been managed um, by Grace and West. Oh, um, mm -hmm. so the, the school we visited in mm -hmm. a few Puerto months Madera ago. Puerto Madera was. Yeah. 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 I mean, but also, I, thought, I found, you know, just as a, as a, um, a way of addressing that um, Grace and West, the talk was very uh, conversant in issues at the school. We saw it from beginning to end, you know, presented that really um, you know, cogently. You know, what the school desired, the, the way they phased it, the, you know, um, answering from um, the difference in how, you know, what, what they were able to do at the beginning to what, um, for the long haul. The fact that they were also chosen to come back for the later phases of the school district as well was, was just something that's apart from the district interview process, was kind of a happy um, mm. ability mm -hmm. to kind of see it. Thank you for mentioning that, because I didn't realize that they were the mm -hmm. firm. Um, also, I, I guess to me, I, I don't see the conflict in, in donations. First, the, the bond campaign mm -hmm. is uh, is deliberately not a district function. It's once the board elects to have a bond, But furthermore, I think it's how <clears throat> common it is not to solicit for um, donations from entire pools of candidates, but actually from those firms that work with the district now is not unique to San Bruno. In fact, I think that's that's largely why bonds are, are typically bond campaigns are typically well funded because there are. Um, firms that have already worked for school districts on um, projects like that. I don't see it. I mean, we can ask about that, that angle of um, perceived conflict, but I, but I don't see it. Mr. Chair, you bring up a good point. Um, and my question is to you, Kevin, as our colleague, is that in your experience with bonds and understanding this, it's not uncommon for a construction company or architecture donate to the bond campaign. 
the ones that you already, if they're, if, if they're not using it to see coming into the district, is mm -hmm. that it, there's a real difference there between that and, and leveraging those relationships of what they see on in um, to turn around and make the fact of the donation a disqualifying factor would be, um, I think, unprecedented. Okay. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would say, would you please, if you promise never to do work in San Fernando again. Yeah. <laughs> that's, like, that's, that's not the way. Yeah. For the chair, Kevin, thank you. Um, I also think this is good. We have our legal counsel here to, to discuss mm -hmm. as well. So, if the board chooses, yeah, we is is that? Are you open to answering that question? <laughs> you can talk a, maybe a little, elaborate a little bit more about. The I just want to mention that there were several firms that donated to the insurance. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. not not just this one exactly. single firm. A lot of firms. A lot of, yeah, a lot of firms. So I could give you about a forty-five minute presentation on the various bodies of conflict of interest law, but. The really short answer is that the Fair Political Practices Commission has found that donations to a bond campaign are not a conflict of interest. So legally, they do not create a conflict of interest. Um, and you know, we're happy to respond with any conflict of interest questions you have, but that's the answer on that one. I think that doing your due diligence to know that you have looked at a number of firms and, and how they performed, you know, it sounds as though you have gone through a solid competitive selection process. And um, you know, it sounds as though that is exactly what the decision is based upon, is that process. Mr. Chair, I, I, I wasn't speaking about conflict of interest. If I wanted to um, speak upon that, I would have said it. Um, and I, dis I disagree with you, um, Henry and Kevin. Um, the reason why I bring that up is because when we first went, the first, our first go around, it just so happened that Greystone West and the architect firm were the only two that submitted proposals. And knowing that those two were the top donors of the bond. It just did not give the appearance to the committee. It just looked like it was like, okay, well, if you give this, then hey, we're gonna give you the, the project at the end. So that's my concern with the distrust that we have throughout the community. Um, that That's my concern and just the, the perception that is um, being presented to the community regarding the fact that it just so happens that they're coming back. I would have preferred Greystone West not giving money. Then I would say, well, hey, you know what? Yes, we have this history. Um, maybe I would approve it and say, yes, let's continue this relationship with Greystone West. Um, and so that wouldn't have been a problem for me, but it, 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 it is a problem for me. And that's why I cannot um, support this. Um, that's being uh, proposed before us tonight. I think, I'll, I'll, I appreciate what you're saying, but I just wanted to clarify that, that the name of that kind of a um, perceived ethical conflict or something is conflict of interest. So I think that's why we're mm -hmm. taking the concern that you have and asking mm -hmm. whether it's a conflict of interest. That's I'm when it's talking not, about the perception that we are and yeah. giving the community, um, it just looks like we're just handing it over to them. That's all I'm saying. But it's also, the sure. district never asked. I just want to mention in January, I had, I had the exact same concerns, and so I, I didn't ask if it was a conflict of interest, but it was explained that it wasn't, so so I'm okay with with the, the selection being made. Well, but we, but it has come up, but, but I want to say that that is a logical question to have. Well, I, I uh, to the chair, I, I appreciate that you have the same concern, but I'm just, uh, reiterating again, it's about perception and regarding the distrust that we have. Um, I just feel it's going to continue to grow if we, when this is approved um, that we are giving, um, with, that we're going to approve based on West mm -hmm. to continue working in our district. That's all I'm saying. Okay. So please, yes. Henry and Kevin, don't analyze it too much, please. 
Yeah, so I'm talking about perception, I'm not talking about conflict of interest. I'm on the perception of the community, of the people that voted to support the bond. That's what I'm saying. Sure. Okay. Okay. We're, I think we're, we're a lot closer than you, you realize, but go ahead. Uh, perceptions are perceptions. There's a fact and the realities are such that I think it's been demonstrated in a public meeting, a process that's gone through, the committee has outlined the legal opinion in terms of the question. I think the public is seen, it's been well vetted. And so you can have your concerns, but this is showing that we have done the due diligence as the trustees of this district. Through the chair, um, I just would have appreciated us going through, doing our due diligence the first time around and not having to uh, direct staff to be a little bit more thorough. And I've already appreciated and thank um, uh, Wendy at a previous meeting uh, regarding her being very thorough uh, and listening to the board and giving staff directions. And um, so, um, I'm, let's just vote. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so I'd like to restate the, the motion is not the same as the title of the action item. So oh. I'd like to sure. state the, that the motion on the, the table is goes. that the um, school board, the Board of Education, authorized staff to enter into contract negotiations for program management services on the Allen Elementary School project and the program manager, or with the program manager, uh, recommended by staff. And so I will. Amend the original amendment. I mean the motion with that clarification. That's, that is the, the motion. But um, Dr. Kent, did the council do that? And Terry the Chavez, he had the second. He second yes. Amendment. Okay, and so we'll do a roll call. Yes, please. Ms. Blanco. No. Terry Chavez. Yes. Henry Sanchez. Aye. Andy Mason. Aye. And and Kevin Martinez. Aye. So the motion passes 4 1. Uh, thank you. Um, item D2 is a selection of pool of qualified construction managers for Measure X projects pursuant to RFP Q number 004. Is it the same? P? It is. P? Okay, thank you. Yes, it is. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to read exactly uh, the same process um, that we went through, but it, it was the same process. And I had told you that we um, narrowed the pool, the proposals down from seven to four that we would include in a, in a pool of construction management teams. Um, and those would be, Greystone West, Swinnerton, Cumming, Jennings, Gales, and Martinez. Those are the four companies that firms that we would um, suggest, recommend to, to be our construction management uh, pool. So what that really means is, should we decide um, to have a different construction management for uh, other projects, we could pull and ask the, um, them to give us proposals on those other projects. To the chair, so moved. Second. Any questions? Staff. Um, any um, community comment? Or discussion? Okay. We'll call for so, uh, so to clarify, just to restate the motion, the Board of Education approves staff's recommendation, which is four firms or identified firms, for the measure X pool of construction managers pursuant to RFQ slash P number 004. Trustee Blanco? No. Trustee Chavez? Aye. Trustee Sanchez? Aye. Trustee Mason? Aye. Trustee Martinez? Aye. So the motion passes for one. Item D3, uh, consideration of authorization of staff to pursue negotiation of Allen Elementary School project construction manager project consistent with RFQ slash P number 004. So <clears throat> this is still through the same process that we had um, 
for the two prior action items. And again, we would um, recommend that the for the construction, are we going for, is this, to, um, to be considered to pursue negotiations of um, the construction management for the Allen Elementary School project. Um, again, we are um, recommending that it would be Grace on what that we would get into con um, negotiations with. Through the chair, so moved. Second. Uh, any questions for I, I, uh, My clarifying question mm -hmm. is that I know it's Measure X Allen project, right? So if ultimately all designs and workflows need to come through the board, correct? Correct. So um, like where we want the school to be built, design, correct. specs. Um, yes. The reason why I ask this is because Allen sits adjacent to Mills Park. And I know there's talks with the city about Mills Park and development of that area. So. That's why we would go through the fine design phase. And okay. We would definitely be bringing it back to the board for them to make any kind of that's, approval on that. That's a later discussion. Yes, it mm -hmm. is. And, and this and this is really the so that so this is so to understand so we've got the program manager for Measure X, mm -hmm. we'll have the architect, and then we have the construction manager. Construction management is for the construction, the actual construction of the project later on down the line. Got it. So the program manager, along with the architect and the team, will do all of those things that you're you're asking about, and we'll bring it back to the board. There'll be community input. Great. There'll be board input. There there are a variety of steps, many more than. And, you know, right. it takes time for us yes. to do that. Yes. <laughs> and, and one of the, um, uh, in the proposal that uh, Grace Unless gave us, they will be doing um, photographs for us um, and, and even a little timeline. And we will definitely be putting all of that um, coordinating space specifically on the district website so that we can see the progress gotcha. um, as it's going step by step by step. And we'll look at options. Oh, definitely. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. So if I could, one question. I think it was actually the earlier item, but just to clarify that it was the, it was the program management role is now, would be, the expectation would be that, that in that role, um, the next level of work for the pools of architects or individual architects for things will be coming, will follow right. from this rather than where we might have started. Right, what we thought would be a, a better move on our part um, to make it um, as transparent as possible is we wanted to be able to bring on the program management and have that person give us input to when we're looking at the um, architects because that's going to be a very critical um, piece of the puzzle where they have to work together very uh, easily and function well. And um, the program manager, he's going to be setting the stage of this is the amount of budget we have and this is where we want it to stay. He's going to be giving all of those parameters um, and working with the architect when we finally do make that decision. We're in the process now of doing the rating of the um, architects and um, when it comes to the interview process we'll probably have the PM come in just so that uh, they because they might have some um, more precise questions specific questions that they would want to make sure are um, in there and so we would do that but it will be based on the, the team that rates it and interviews uh, to make the decision and bring back the recommendation to the board for final approval. And the expectation would be um, uh, perhaps like pools of architects and individual yes. assignments. We will also, that will be doing the same type, exact same thing. We will um, bring forth a pool of architects mm -hmm. so that uh, depending on the project, we could, if we needed to, use another architect for another project. And then we would also bring back for recommendation to the board the architect that we would have for the Allen project. Any other questions? I, uh, through the chair, I, I recall that um, you had mentioned that you received um, the overwhelming response to the 
the request for a proposal for architecture? Thing? Yeah, and, and when I had uh, given you that there was eight construction and 11 architect, um, apparently we miscounted one, and so we might have 12 on the architect, uh, and, and I showed you that we had seven. So we do have, right. we do yeah. have a good, a good selection of firms thank you. from all over the place. We, we, we'd like to thank you for bringing yes. that item back, mm -hmm. and tabling it, and right. it's now much more objective data for certain. Right. Thank you. Um, I haven't seen any also any public comment. Yes. No public no. comment. No public Is there any other board discussion you wish? No. Okay, so I think we could. So the, I guess I'd like to see the motion if I can. That the board authorize staff to enter into contract negotiations for construction management services on the Allen Elementary School project with the construction manager recommended by staff. And they would um, I'll I'll amend the motion accordingly. Okay. Second. Second. All right, so we'll call vote. Trustee Blanco? No. <coughs> Trustee Chavez? Aye. Trustee Sanchez? Aye. Trustee Mason? Aye. Trustee Martinez? Aye. So the motion passes 4 1. To the chair, yes. would it be all right if I invited Todd sure. up? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Um, Ms. Blanco, I know. You have some concerns about Parkside, specifically pick up drop off uh, there. And I think there's some misconceptions that we decide on your design, and that's simply not the case. Um, I have here five of the design options for the pick up drop off that were sketched and reviewed uh, for the Parkside school that I was able to find, and actually there was many more than this. Um, that's not our role. Um, the actual final layout for the pickup and drop off was decided by staff. Uh, Dr. Hutt, Linda Wrong, um, Angela Adiago, and Stan Little uh, were the team that decided. And the concerns were around leaving green space and trees in the front of the school uh, as opposed to taking them out to provide the additional lane. Um, there were concerns raised about traffic, there was a lot of discussion. Um, but ultimately, it's not our role to make those decisions. I'd love to meet with you to try and reconcile our differences and hopefully provide some explanation that might you make feel better about the decision. The chair, I, I, I think you have been maybe misinformed. Um, that wasn't just my only concern. Okay. There was a list. I apologize if you weren't um, provided that list. Um, I'd be more than happy. We do have a long time relationship, but as you heard, um, my concern wasn't just that. It was the way that I would have preferred that Grace and West would not have given to the to the campaign. Um, but th that's you know I'm not I'm not quiet about that. But um, yes, I would love to have a conversation with you regarding what happened at Parkside. Um, so that's fine. I appreciate I'm it. More Thank than you very happy much to do that. I also tell you that, that um, we were asked to make a donation and we were asked for the amount. I, I know you were. I, I know you were. But what, 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 I, what I want to make sure clear with you again is that the way that is perceived by the community, I would have preferred that um, you and the architect that came about with the middle of the RFPs to uh, the first go around. Just personally, um, hearing from the community, it just it doesn't. It, it's not a good way to present regarding transparency throughout the park, the process, and this is exactly why I was so against supporting it all along. So I, I, I will tell you that um, we were very aggressive in our pursuit of uh, to be awarded this contract. Um, I get very close to my districts. I've been with you guys for 10 years, mm -hmm. and you're family to me, mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, I don't want to see anybody else come in and, mm -hmm. and mess that up. So we were aggressive on our fee, and I think that's part of the, the calculation. No, I, I appreciate that yeah. you feel that way towards our district, but I, I, I don't feel that this is, um, how can I say, uh, your fault. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Um, so I will tell you, I, again, attorney relationship with the district. I know your sites uh, well um, over the time period. Uh, you will get our A game as we put up every, every district. I think if you look at our track record in districts on the peninsula up and down, we have a long-standing record of program management, uh, maintaining budgets, uh, maintaining schedules. We've never had projects fall off the list and not get completed. Um, and uh, we'll, we feel very strongly about our reputation and we want to maintain it. And we thank you for the con your consideration and ultimate selection. And I look forward to rolling up my sleeves and working with you. Thank you. We look forward to working with you. Number two, uh, item uh, number one, future business request for agenda items. For the chair, I request an agenda item by the see it listed there. For the March meeting. No, but this, it should have been listed there. Uh, the scene arrangement, since it became such a concern. That's all. Just want to let yeah, you know not that it was, it was not, it was, yeah, I, I understand, but I had um, asked for it. And, um, but it was, was not going to be on the agenda tonight. I was expecting to see it there listed under, I know that. We have not done. I, I, I just expected to see it where it said a uh, future, a future item. Oh, no, and no. I do have to get going because my child says, um, okay. Okay, so um, good night. Uh, noting I, uh, the student. I, I, I have one. Um, an industrial arts program. This is something that's pressing, pressing, but I think as we start to rebuild schools, we might talk about industrial arts. So, are you saying, uh, as that's traditionally the point of middle schools? Yes. Thanks, Kevin. No, we'll have it. Yeah. yeah, I can provide more details later to staff. Okay, yeah, I think this one would need to put it out. Yes. Right, yeah. Chair, what, uh, Stella, what would you see as a time frame for an item like that to, to bring it back to the... Well, in, in in 21st century educational programs, industrial arts itself as a as a as an elective, like what we had when we were in high school, no longer exists. Right. So um, so there are various other kinds of programs out there through the electives, the elective wheel, robotics, coding, those kinds of things. Right. Uh, there's a, a project lead the way program, and so there are various kinds out there that are maker space type engineering principle based programs. And so I'd like to meet with uh, with uh, Trustee Mason to hear a little bit more about what he's thinking and we can provide a little bit of information about what a middle school elective cycle looks like because I think the, the, based on the presentation last time and the question about the foreign language and now the question about industrial arts, I think maybe this might be more about elective options at the middle sure. school. And Absolutely. maybe we could focus on that a little bit more if that's the will of the board. Yeah, thank you. Um, for this in particular, though, there is um, other community resources that play into like that old to the um, you know to the the loss of that perhaps uh, traditional function of the schools. If you know just like how communities meet this for their middle school and high school age students mm -hmm. absent a particular program, you know just. Right, now, and, and, and I think the other thing to think about too is that there are um, uh, in the industry pathways that some schools um, have. For instance, for their middle school, you would have, um, so let's say you're doing an information technology pathway. Mm -hmm. So matriculating up to the high school, the kids at the ninth grade would have some sort of course, but we would go, you would step back and say, what would that look like at an, at an element, at a, at a middle school? whether those are in the design features. And, and so I have experience implementing that in, um, in a previous uh, position uh, where we had our articulated pathways and we had small learning communities at our middle school 
that matriculated to the high school program. So like there was a, a hospital, was a hospital, there was a nursing pathway, and then there was a, um, a pathway for IT, so information technology pathway. And so the middle school design was really around developing those little academies. Uh, so I, I can bring some information to the board regarding what that would look like and then how that is embedded into not just the electives, but also through the entire coursework at a school so that it becomes not just a standalone. That'd be great. Okay, so just to depend, you know, what kind of app our future appointment dates for Wednesday, March 6th. I have governance retreat here at the district office at 6.30 p.m. On Wednesday, March 13th, a regular board meeting at Parkside Middle School. Um, on Wednesday, March 20th, the governance retreat at the district office here at 6.30. And on April 10th, our regular board meeting at Allen Elementary School at uh, where the public session starts at 7 p.m. Excuse me, Chair. Isn't that the uh, March 6th also the portrait of the graduate during the day? It's the 11th. 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 Okay, the following. Yeah. See, that would be one long day. Okay, so I think um, we're adjourned. I do want to say one thing before we adjourn. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, that's uh, fine. Thank you. We will be taking board photos on March the 20th. Oh, yes, don't turn you. away. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be taking new board photos that. on the 20th of March, so yeah. uh, bring, you know, a dress appropriately for the new for photos. My, my Disney apparel. Yes, and that will be uh, that will be right before the governance retreat, so uh, he'll be here at about 5.30, so we'll have dinner before the retreat, and, and we'll yeah. take your picture. Can we wear, wear yeah. Mickey Mouse hats? No. Yeah. Okay. Come as you are. Thank you, Richard. Lobby.